Good evening, everyone. Warm welcome all of you to a Zilling Webinar Distinguished Lecture Program presented by Instrumentation and Measurement Society, EMS, IEEE, SBC, and SSEE, providing IMS chapters around the world with talks by experts on topics and interest and import importance of the INM community. The lecturers are among the most qualified experts in their own field, and we offer our members a first chance to interact with these experts during their lectures. And I'm pretty sure this will be a great moving session for you guys. And yes, be ready with your exuberant heart to shag the session. Now I invite Swadi Chantra R, the chair of IEEE IMS SBSSCE for the keynote address. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Uh, hi, friends out there. I, uh, on behalf of IEEE IMS SBC NSSE, cordially welcomes you to the first IMS Distinguished Lecture Program in the section. We are grateful to you to take out uh, some time to join us at this great event. I'm extremely pleased to welcome those who have been serving our student branch for a long time and those who, have re those who are here today. Firstly, I would like to welcome the chief guest for the event, Professor Marco Muknaini, assistant professor at uh, the University of Siena, Italy, and the award recipient for the best national PhD thesis in the maintenance context from CNIM, National Italian Center for Maintenance. He is the author and co-author of more than 90 papers in international paper, reviewed journals and uh, conferences, and of fine national and international patents. Welcome, sir. I would like to welcome Dr. Sharada Jayakrishna, who is currently serving as the chairperson of IEEE Kerala section. She is also a professional member in American Society for Quality, ASQ, and uh, Director General Manager of Termo Penpol Private Limited. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Swati. Next, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Vijitas, the student branch counselor of IEEE SBNSSE, who was providing constant high energy to her words till date. Welcome, ma'am. And of course, I welcome uh, our Shivakumar, sir, who is the student branch uh, a chapter advisor of uh, IEEE Student Brand Chapter, NSS College of Engineering. Welcome, sir. And the whole participants, and the whole participant panel who are eagerly watching the session live in YouTube. We hope you have a great time and that keep enjoying the event as you always have. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Thank you so much. Now I invite the splendid person, Dr. Sharada Jayakumar, the chair of IEEE Kerala section and who is currently the DGMO of Thermo Penpo Limited for the welcome address. Please, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Swati. By the way, uh, please correct. It is Sharada Jayakrishnan, okay? Not Jayakumar. Uh, when you are um, when you are looking at the names, please be correct in spelling that. And I guess uh, welcome has already been mentioned by Swati, so I'll just have a felicitation from my side as chair of IEEE Kerala section. Uh, so this is uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, to Doctor to Professor Marco for um, deciding to give a distinguished lecture uh, for the students of NSS College of Engineering and also the other student volunteers of Kerala section. Uh, so uh, welcome from uh, the section side on the, on the point. And uh, I'm also very happy to see that we have uh, a society. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you so much for the enlightened words. Now I invite the most vibrant person of ours, Dr. Vijita S., the branch counselor of IEEE SBNSSEE, to have a blink about what IEEE SBNSSEE is. Over to you, ma'am. 
good evening to one and all respected sharda ma'am marco sir professor shivakumar and all the other students who are present it's a great pleasure to see ims organizing an dlp today i'm uh, very happy to be the counselor of uh, vibrant ieee sbnssc we have been organizing a lot of programs even during the lockdown and i think we have scored over more than 100 programs and uh, our sb has got so much of energy and we've got a lot of energetic people that uh, we are never in deficient of programs so based on that this is one of the greatest achievements that we have got in arranging the dlp though this is a virtual one i know it is going to be one of the best we also had the student activities professional awareness from ieee students and ieee young professionals kerala section the young professionals kerala section were again a well versed group which was giving them all the techniques and all the advices needed for being a, a professional apart from this we had capped lot of uh, awards and some among them are outstanding student branch award in the section in the year 2019 we also got the outstanding pes student branch award uh, <clears throat> in the uh, section outstanding ia student branch uh, chapter globally it is sbc 2019 we were 14th in position in ieee pes hp sbcp high performance student branch chapter program globally and second position in india 19th position in the largest pes sbc globally we are also powered up we have also powered up a tribal colony as a part of pe we also bagged the individual recognitions like best pes volunteer in the section year 2019 and also the best humanitarian volunteer of the section before the lockdown began we actually had conducted a four day event known as expiron and it was a national level event with lot of participants from all over india the participant had a great time and a wonderful experience during the event and it was well organized and volunteered by our by our students we had four workshops followed by four hackathons we went Uh, visit two industries and also we had wonderful uh, feedback sessions with young professionals also it was really a mind blowing event on that day i have briefed what we had for the sb this year and it was actually a tremendous pleasure for me to work with each and every one and i'm also happy that ims has taken up all the pain in bringing in the dlp and i wish them all the success and hope this program is a very good one and very useful to all of you thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much your words will always and shine in our hearts now let's have the privilege of listening to the distinguished lecturer of professor marco magnani the distinguished lecturer of ieee ims and currently the assistant professor at the university of siena italy I invite Professor Marco Magnani to take over the session and let's all have the pleasure of listening it. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Okay, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is uh, Marco Magnani as, um, and I work as an uh, associate uh, professor at the University of Siena and I'm also IEEE Instrumentation and Measurement Distinguished Lecturer. So that's the reason why of this uh, template here. Uh, the title is uh, general because it's linked to dependability subject, which means everything that is connected to uh, fall detection, fall prevention, fall management, and uh, reli reliability, availability, and design for safety. So that's the uh, reason why of this title. Moreover, the, fo the focus will be on some examples linked to industrial applications. Um, Definitions. Uh, uh, most of you is, uh, is well aware of what reliability is, but this is just uh, a uh, reminder, a small recap. 
Reliability is the ability of an item to perform a required function, which from now on I will call mission because it's one of the most important things in defining reliability assessment, under a given condition for a given time interval. But this is not really exploitable definition in terms of engineering. Why? Because it's, uh, the ability cannot be measured. So this kind of concept translates to a probability, eh, as a, a matter of fact, in terms of uh, uh, things that can be exploited to make evaluations. The same concept applies also to availability, which is barely similar to reliability concept, but here uh, we introduce the uh, argumentation that time can be interrupted. So it means that uh, basically you have to keep into account maintenance actions. So you're not interested in, interested in the time to failure of an item, but the mean time to failure, that is uh, how much is going to be usable okay, over its life. And then safety, where the objective is to free your item from unacceptable risk of physical injury to persons, okay, basically. So, uh, why reliability and dependability is, is important? The reason is because there, are, uh, there is a wide um, bunch of examples where reliability matter uh, play the role. For example, here <coughs> I reported here just three events that are um, in the mind of persons, I suppose. One is the Challenger event, which uh, costed the life of the entire crew of the shuttle. And this is due to the failure of a basic uh, 70 cents or ring. Mm. And uh, the deep water horizon uh, out of the Mexican coast where a valve uh, in placed in the bottom of the ocean failed. And this caused uh, this huge event with a lot of consequences in terms of environmental impact. And here there is a, a simply a, a, a collision between a, a, a tree rail uh, with a garbage track on, that happened on January the 4th, uh, 2016, with uh, small consequences. But this is just to provide you uh, a, a, an overview that reliability and safety is not just linked to electronics or computer science, it's something that affects everything in our life. Because uh, whenever you design a card, an electronic card, an electronic board is to perform some kind of actions or to interact with a mechanical system or with other electronic components that at the end of the story will have an, actuate on, an actuation system. So the problem is that uh, to perform reliability study you cannot just segmentate your knowledge in terms of uh, electronics or mechanics or chemistry. You have to see the whole picture. Okay? fail, you're going to have a lot of failures and a lot of pieces that are coming back to your factory. And then you're scratching your head saying, oh my God, what's happening? And you have to start saying, I have to fix this problem. And in this case, when you are fixing this problem, you are basically decreasing the failure rate because uh, you expect in the same amount of time a reduced number of failures once you are fixing your product. Then you have a central section where you have a constant failure rate, and this is usually applicable to electronic components because uh, uh, the constant rate means, uh, means that basically you expect to have uh, observing a certain uh, time space the same amount of failures over time as, as an average, okay? So it means that um, the number of failures that you have in a certain amount of time is independent of the uh, of the place where you are looking at, okay? And then you have the last section, which is called increasing failure rate. And this is typical of mechanical components, where whenever you place your system in a field, once you start using it, then the number of failures that you expect in a certain amount of time is increasing due to wear out, for example. Okay, this is the example uh, that is really easy to, to understand is the piston of a car. Uh, the more you use the piston, the easier is the way you are rubbing it and the easier is the wear out that you are going to expect for this kind of component in the car. Okay, so summing up, we can say that in the central part, usually we have a behavior for uh, uh, electronic components and in the right part, the far right part, where the failure rate is increasing, we have a behavior for mechanical components. So the, the, the question is, is there any 
probability density function that is uh, that allows me to cover this kind of behavior and the answer is yes of course of course for example exploiting the wavelength uh, probability density function that has the shape here that it, it, that is described by this equation here where there are two three parameters one is beta which is the shape factor eta is called the characteristic life and is measured in hours the measurement unit is hours and the T0 is the displacement factor that allows you to place correctly the probability uh, density function over time in, in a certain time space. Okay, exploiting this kind of shape, then we can get uh, um, the idea of how the hazard function is, uh, is, uh, is shaped. Because the hazard function can also be defined as the ratio between the probability density function and the reliability, okay? So in case of the Weibull function, this ratio is given by exactly this term, which is beta over eta times uh, t minus t uh, noted over eta at the beta minus one. So looking at the this shape uh, and uh, this equation, uh, the behavior of this, uh, of this function depends on the shape factor. If beta, is uh, less than one, then we have a time decreasing function. And this helps us in modeling the early infant mortality failure, which is here the dotted red uh, curve. If beta is greater than one, we have the yellow dotted line. So we are able to model the wear out. If beta is equal to one, we have a constant, which is one over eta, which is exactly the characteristic, uh, one over the characteristic life, which is exactly the uh, constant uh, uh, ran uh, so random failure uh, area, that is the green uh, area. Uh, of course, if eta, which is the characteristic life, is measured in hours or days or weeks or years, so its measurement unit is time, it comes by itself that the hazard function or failure rate has as a measurement unit the number or fraction of failures over time. So this is the basic uh, uh, idea that we have. Uh, if we come back to the uh, fundamental reliability law that we have seen before, do you remember? Uh, the reliability was equal to the exponential of minus the integral between 0 and t of the hazard function. And we replace, instead of the hazard function, 1 over eta, for example, in constant, uh, uh, in constant regime, so in the constant uh, uh, or random area, and one over eta is called the lambda, then we come to the easiest way to describe the reliability, which is e at the minus lambda t. And this is the most easy way to describe, the, the easiest way to describe the uh, reliability function for constant component. This equation allows us to model for electronic system, uh, even complex situation, and we're able to find closed form solution okay for mechanical components where the hazard function is increasing that's not so easy and usually that's the reason why we exploit monte carlo simulation or in general simulations okay but the, at this point we have to ask ourselves okay but is it is this way effective to uh to describe reliability uh the answer is uh, yes and no it's uh, effective in terms of engineering it's not effective in terms of um, commercial. Uh, for example, if you go into a car sh service shop and you ask to an operator, uh, how much is reliable my, my car? You cannot expect him to ask you to, to reply you, oh, it's 0 0.98 uh, at a certain time reliable. <laughs> it's something that it, it never happens, OK? It has a, a certain of uh, effectiveness when you are designing something in a, in a designing team. But in terms of commercial transfer to the to the to the mass to the to the public, you know, we, we have to find some kind of um, uh, more efficient indicator. And uh, one of these kind of indicator is called mean time to failure or MTTF for non repairable system or mean time between failures for repairable system. And uh, as a, a mean time that is an average of a random variable. Usually this kind of uh, uh, number, because it's a number, can be found integrating the uh, random variable, which is in our case the time, because uh, the, the random variable in, in this kind of content 
context is uh, when our system is going to fail because it's something that you can estimate but you you don't know if you take any kind of hardware today you cannot know exactly the time when it's going to fail you can predict a failure time a mean time to failure looking at different kind of uh, items with a confidence bound okay and uh, so we have to get this kind of number integrating from zero to infinity the random variable that is time times the probability density function if you make this integral this is equivalent to make the integral between zero and infinity of the reliability function so again from the probability density function you can get the reliability function if you get the reliability function you can get the mean time to first failure okay but is it good and the answer is a yes and no why it's easy to understand to, to be understood by itself if you if i give you uh, two cars and one car is going to fail after one day and one car is going to fail uh, after 364 days the average is something that is in the middle six months but given two cars uh one which is going to fail after one day and the other one after one year is it real that the mean time is uh, six months no because one failed the first day and the other one the last day so this kind of parameter is not so good if you don't have enough samples to be able to build a, a good confidence bound that is usually what you have to do is a really to have a really good description of the probability density function otherwise uh, everything that is getting is just uh, something that can jeopardize your design okay so pay attention to synthesis parameter how do we move in terms of reliability modeling uh, usually we start from system that have to be modeled we build a so-called reliability block diagram that you can find in different kind of software and then you can get the reliability estimation but how can you get from a reliability block diagram a reliability estimation uh, what you get is uh, the comparison of different kind of uh, configuration you can have the so-called canonical configuration which usually are series parallel or hot cold and by or k over n but these are mm, uh, let's say something that is that can be found into the electronic uh, companies sector but it's something that really doesn't apply too much to oil and gas and mechanical systems mixed configurations that are usually something that is um, used in oil and gas and mechanical system or non-canonical uh, configuration uh, what does it mean non-canonical that cannot be solved in an analytical way so you don't have the possibility to have closed form solutions okay so the first two kind of families that is canonical configuration and mixed configurations are easy configurations that provide you closed closed form solutions that allows you to uh, generalize the result but they are really not so common in in practical applications and non-canonical solutions or configurations that needs different way to uh, approach them uh, here i listed some of them one is called critical block method the other one is called cut and tie enumeration method and more and more today uh, there are softwares which provide Monte Carlo simulations uh, to, to have this kind of solutions how do we get the reliability assessment because uh, of course you can have two kind of problems you have an item that is built that is built by someone else and you are asked to evaluate the reliability um, figures of this item or you have to design your own system according to a specification okay uh, in this let letter case uh, whenever you have to design something before you have to understand uh, which are the requirements of your system uh, and usually what you do is that uh, you you have to exploit some reliability techniques uh, and uh, these are divided into three big families the quantitative and here you have a lot of methods that allows you to find um, uh, numbers that are coping with your design but of course to get this kind of information you have to have uh, an idea of your definitive design okay because if you change something uh, then the result would change radically or dramatically 
qualitative system means uh, or qualitative approach means that you have um, uh, the possibility to design your system uh, in a really wide way uh, without so many constraints but of course the confidence bound that you will get on your system is huge so the prediction will not be easy in terms of uh, granting to someone results okay and the last uh, approach relies on semi-quantitative uh, uh, that are divided again into two huge families one is called top down and the other one bottom up and uh, families and these are uh, something that lies in the middle that is allows you to get a quantitative analysis but not in a really constrained way so the techniques that are listed that are listed under each column here in this presentation should be applied depending on, on which is your target usually the qualitative uh, part the qualitative tool tools are exploited during the design phase preliminary design phases okay the quantitative are uh, exploited in the very last definition of the requirements of the, our tools and the semi-quantitative is something that lies in the middle. That is, is something that you can do after the quality, the preliminary assessment and before the final quantitative definition. Uh, here, there is an example, for example, of the full tree analysis toolbox. Uh, this is a, a practical way to define uh, the uh, reliability of a system in an easy way, okay, but in, in a really rough way. Uh, it's a combination of basic events, which are the circles, where usually you assign a defined probability of something that uh, should be avoided. And then there is a combination of logical blocks like AND port or OR port or XOR port, okay? And for example, the AND output will, will be just the product of all the uh, uh, probabilities that are the input of this kind of port, while the OR gate will be just one minus the product of the complementary to one probabilities of this event. What does it mean? The basic event is that something that you would like to avoid, okay? So, for example, I don't want to have an explosion in this factory. And you start describing which are the possible causes that are leading uh, to this final event that you want to avoid. And then you have to ask yourself uh, which kind of events should, be, should happen jointly. And in this case, you add an, an end. Uh, for them and uh, uh, instead if you understand that you, just one of the causes that you are selecting is enough to get your final event you combine them in an or door for example uh, if you are aware of which are the probabilities of each single event then the uh, possibility to uh, combine them through this couple of equation would give you the final probability of this event that you and you want to avoid. So here, what you get at the end of the story is the unreliability. And once you get the unreliability, if you have the complement to one of the uh, reliability of the of the unreliability, you get the reliability. Remember that this is not a general model, because here in the basic event, in each basic event, you cannot place a function. Usually, you place a number, and the number corresponds to a reliability. But we have seen before, the reliability is a function of time. So to place there a number, it means you have set the time where you want to get your investigation. So to get the evolution of the reliability over time, it's not enough to get this model once, but you should have this model evaluated for each time instant that you want to consider. So, okay, once we get uh, this part, you say it's easy, no? Because um, what is important to have is the hazard function. And then once I get the hazard function, I can get the reliability of any item. That's true. Uh, the, the tough part here is to get the hazard function information. Um, consider that uh, usually if uh, you need the, uh, uh, the, the fail rate for, um, um, an electronic component is expressed in uh, uh, FIT, that is called FIT, uh, which uh, stands for failure unit, okay? And one failure unit means that is uh, one failure over billion events. So it means that uh, 
if you make this kind of evaluation for 100 feet, the time that you need to observe 100 failure is approximately 100,000 hours, okay? So it's 11 years. So if you start looking at your resistor today and your resistor has a failure rate of 100 feet, uh, within uh, 11 years of uh, continuous working operation, then probably you will experience a failure. Probably, yeah, because it's it's uh, an indication. Depends on the on the on the um, confidence bound. So it means that you understand that in, in uh, companies couldn't uh, derive in this case uh, a failure rate of all the components because it it uh, the testing phase uh, could take too much time. Okay. So, uh, need that uh, arose, and uh, it was the mean to accelerate uh, the me mechanism that causes the, the, the device failure. Because in this case, if I the device, I can get the failure far in advance, but then at this, at this time, I have to be able to uh make reverse engineering and understand how my ma how many times uh, did i accelerate my test to find the real um failure rate uh here i listed four common stresses that are used uh, to accelerate device failure and these are mostly used in electronic components okay but uh so temperature is one because uh most of the electronics is based on semiconductors and semiconductors, you know, are based on mobility and uh, and uh, on um, uh, material diffusion. And of course, temperature plays a, a, a huge role. OK, if you think uh, just to a diet, now a diet has a simple equation that depends on the inverse saturation current and on the uh, applied voltage and on the uh, VT, which is usually the uh, temperature uh, voltage. OK. So uh, temperature plays a role in the in the working way uh, an electronic component uh, is is working uh, on a simple PN junction. So imagine on a very complex device, or in an ASIC or in a microcontroller. Voltage, of course, and current, and also temperature cycling, uh, uh, which is used to accelerate mechanical failure on chips, for example, because. Uh, this is what I told you at the beginning. You don't have to consider that reliability is something that is applicable just to electronics. Whenever you de design something that is electronics, you have different materials, different suppers. So also temperature cycling, if everything is designed perfectly in terms of electrical path, can have a problem in terms of mechanical compatibility of materials. Placing a die on an alumina substrate, which have different different temperature coefficient may lead you a problem in the in the near future if you buy tons of uh, chips in this kind of system and you haven't considered the different expansion coefficients of different materials so different failure mechanism may be accelerated by different level of stresses even if uh, uh, we have the same time of, st of stress and uh, the risk is that uh, uh, if you don't consider uh, correctly or properly your acceleration factor, then you may see something that is wrong. For example, your current induces a, a temperature rise locally, then you think that the failure that you're going to to experience the mechanical failure came before uh, your attention. Luckily, there are some models that have been developed in the years. One is the well-known Arrhenius, and the other one is Iring uh, for conducting accelerating testing. Uh, Arrhenius usually takes into consideration that you are accelerating your system against uh, only one quantity and usually this quantity is tempered uh, a more com complex environment for example is used when you want to test uh, the acceleration factor with respect to temperature and humidity for example and uh, how can i exploit this kind of relationship uh, the, the answer is is below in in this simple uh, equation that um, if you have an exponential probability density function uh, and then you get uh, the uh, 
information, that, and this is for rating low, then you can get a reliability that is a function of your parameter, not only the time, but also in this case B, which is your parameter that you're accelerating. So you get an information where your failure rate is uh, depending on these uh, uh, accelerating parameters, okay? Uh, do you have to do that by your own every time? The answer again is clean. Uh, the, the, the most important and the most widely used is the military handbook 217F version. And uh, this is used and required uh, from all companies, basically. Uh, and the reason is because it's really conservative. So if you get uh, out of this uh, exploitation of this standard, a reliability that is uh, 0 0.95 at a certain time, it means that probably the right estimate uh, will be 0 0.98 uh, uh, at the same time, okay? Because it's it's really a, a conservative approach in, in this kind of database. Other important databases are the OREDA, and this is used uh, for mechanical components uh, and especially used in the oil and gas uh, because it's... Um, divided in terms of applications. For example, if you consider a centrifugal compressor, to use a centrifugal compressor uh, offshore or onshore, even if the item is exactly the same, has really, really two different uh, reliability figures. Uh, and this is because the operating condition, that is the mission, is defined in a really different way. So the temperature condition is different, the environmental condition are different, the operating condition in general are different and the uh, outcome is different, okay? So uh, as is written here in this slide, uh, all these databases need a sharp mission defined. If you're not able to define the correct mission, again, it's garbage in, garbage out. What you will get in terms of number, it's something that is really, will be really, really far from your real real application. That is, if you don't know the temperature, if you don't know the environment, if you don't know the stress of each component, everything is just a forecast, but it's not something that will cope with your real application, okay? Uh, here, I, I, I tried to give you a, a really fast overview of the connection uh, between the main failure modes and semiconductors. For example, uh, printed circuit board, uh, Failure modes. Uh, the, the, this printed circuit board are vulnerable to environmental influences. For example, uh, if there are, if there is um, corrosion because there is an excess of humidity, uh, uh, can lead uh, an etching of the bias and can lead to an etching of the uh, lanes of conducting path, and so you can have partial shorts and uh, the, the traces may crack due to mechanical failure because you can have uh, not a huge compatibility, compatibility between the materials you have selected uh, uh, for uh, building your circuit. And uh, then you can have also uh, residues of solder flux, which may facilitate corrosions, okay? You can have also polar covalent compounds. And so, uh, you see, whenever you are designing a, a PCB, then you have to pay attention to several designs uh, issues, not just uh, how much should be the lane in order to let a certain current pass. You have also to consider power dissipation, temperature excursion, different material, material resistance in terms of substrate and isolation, and so on. Okay, So uh, to, to design something in terms of functional spec may be challenging, but to embed also reliability constraints, it, it's really tough and challenging. Uh, here, it, there is an example. It's, uh, this is called electromigration. It's, it's really a well-known phenomenon that is taking place uh, in uh, platinum resistors or in aluminum uh, uh, lanes. And this is a, a, a phenomenon uh, where um, you have a constant current applied to a metal stripe, and if you have this uh, constant uh, current uh, uh, flowing in this stripe, you have also transport of material. And this tra transport of material may result in an excess of material in one side, an accumulation of material on one side, and in a depleting of material at the center, for example, in the, in, in the same lane. 
Uh, what does it mean? Uh, if you reduce the section, of course, where this current is flowing, then the current density is going to increase because you have a reduced uh, surface when this, where this current is flowing. So it, it's an auto-increasing um, phenomenon, okay? And uh, cannot be seen at the very beginning. This is something that is where you are really blind. That is, if you design your system and you test for uh, 10 seconds or for one hour, probably you are not able to see this kind of failure mode. Then you deploy 1 million of your items across the world. And after six months, uh, all of them are coming back because you experience a huge failure. So it's not really something that is, um, uh, it's, it's, it's pleasant in terms of factory production. Um, semiconductor failures usually uh, result in generation of hot electrons. And uh, what happens is that you have an accumulation of charge carriers that are trapped in the gate uh, oxide, for example. Of, and this can be also due to assembling phases because uh, in, during assembly, you touch several parts of the circuit. And in uh, some uh, square millimeter, you deploy 100 or 10,000 uh, volt, and uh, then you can have uh, the uh, overall circuit going to fail, and maybe the failure is not visible. So you stand and you deploy it to the market, and this result uh, on going in a catastrophic failure. Okay. Uh, summing up here for semiconductor, you can say that uh, these are very sensitive to impurities and particle. And uh, microprocesses of thin and thin film must be fully understood, uh, be as well as wire bonding, because if you don't pay attention to the fabrication process, you can design everything perfectly on CAD, but it wouldn't work in, in real life. And the uh, ability of semiconductor also may depend on assembly and use, okay, and on environmental conditions, because if your casing is not perfect, perfectly sealing from humidity, then with the uh, different operating condition, for example, if your system is controlling a pump into the desert, then you can have a rise of humidity inside of the circuit, and then you can have a major failure. For mechanical, uh, you have different kinds of failures. And here I've summarized the, the most important. The first one is fracture, okay? Uh, which can be ductile, that is one piece, uh, which provides you warning, for example, when you have uh, increasing vibration into a bar, okay? Or you can have a brittle, that is a fracture in many pieces without warning. And this happens usually in, in uh, rotating machines when you have a coupling with it, between the driven machine and the driver, okay? Uh, in, a, for example, power gen plant. Then you can have fatigue, which is a failure under cyclic stress. And this is really bounded to material uh, composition, okay? So even if you consider, for example, uh, uh, iron or steel uh, for a bar, uh, it makes, uh, the, the production process makes a lot of difference in terms of fatigue uh, uh, possibility to, to, to withstand fatigue cycles, okay? And then you have creeping, okay? Creeping occurs at the elevated temperature and uh, you have the formation uh, which changes with time. And this happens uh, usually for wings or aircraft where you have creeps and you have to be able to understand whether these creeps are bearable or you have to make a repair in the, in the aircraft, okay, before uh, letting fly again. Uh, this is something that I told you, you before, fatigue to uh, the uh, grain diameter of the... Um, of the system that you are considering, and uh, the you have to follow. Usually, uh, there is a rule of thumb that is the one that is co called here, that is recalled here, and uh, you have the Baskin e equation, uh, where you have that uh, the n is the number of cycles that you are considering, sigma is the stress stress amplitude, uh, p and c are empirical constants that depends on the uh, material that you are considering. But at the end of the story. You have to understand that the fatigue that is life to bending uh, of uh, an item is uh, uh, in, in follows an, an inverse proportionality with the grain, grain diameter. So the production process of your mechanical item plays a role in, in the overall system reliability. 
Okay, how do we pass from reliability to availability? Uh, as we said before, we have to add the maintenance concept, okay? In general, we used to summarize the availability behavior of a system by means of an indicator, which is called here A infinite, which is called steady state availability. And this steady state reliability, uh, availability, sorry, is the ratio between the MTBF and the MTBF plus the MTTR. What is the MTTR? MTTR is the time taken to repair a failed hardware module. What, what does it mean? Yeah, MTBF is the mean time between failure. No? So let's suppose you have a system that never fails. So if a system never fails, it means that the MTBF is infinite, okay? Uh, no matter what is the time to repair, let's suppose is 10 hours, the ratio is uh, close to one because you have infinite over infinite plus 10. So it's infinite over infinite is in, in a defined uh, formula expression, but of course the MTBF is the same. So it has the same slope and applying a small math, it means that your system basically is always available. Okay, so the most is the, the time that your system to be restored, the lower is the time the system is available. So availability is a, a ratio on how much my system can be exploited for the mission I have designed it for, okay? How can we model this kind of parameter? Usually to get the availability uh, simulation and to uh, availability figures, we use, uh, we exploit Monte Carlo simulation. Eh? and uh, what we get are numbers with a confidence bound. But there are some cases, for example, where we, are, where we are in presence of electronic components, where we have the constant failure rate. In case of constant failure rate and constant uh, um, repair rate, uh, which is the inverse of the MTTR, we can build and we can exploit homogeneous Markov modeling. So it's called a memoryless system. This is uh, this kind of system are widely used in uh, telecommunication system to understand uh, how much is the probability to transfer an information from one node to another, from one point to another. But in this case, can be exploited to build up a system that is able to describe the dynamics of, for example, two state S zero when my system is working and S one where my system is not working. So I'm able to build a transition matrix that is able to model the dynamics of the probabilities to be in one state as zero or in the other state as one, which is the failed states or the working state. I am interested in the availability of my system. So when my system is available, so I'm interested in the dynamics of, uh, in, in this case, when I have two states, of the probability of being in state as as zero. If we solve in time this kind of system and we let the time go to infinity, we will get exactly this ratio, mi over mi plus lambda, which means the ratio between the mean time, uh, the inverse of the mean time to repair over the inverse, the sum of the inverse of the mean time to repair and the, mean, the inverse of the mean time between failures. And so if you reverse the equation, you get exactly the definition that you get at the very beginning in, uh, in, in availability. Uh, there are different kinds of maintenance policies, okay? Uh, and these are usually uh, used in, in every kind of industrial context. Maybe sometimes they are used in proper way, Sometimes they are used not in, in real proper way. One is called corrective. The other one is improving, opportunistic, or preventive. Let me focus on the preventive one because sometimes, usually, in the companies, uh, there is the feeling that applying preventive maintenance of, on electronic components will bring you benefit. And this is false. Uh, and this can be proven here. Because if you are able to build a, a, a reliability function, function for maintenance, which is described in, in this equation, and you make the ratio between the common reliability function and the reliability function over maintenance, if there is a benefit in performing preventive maintenance, then this ratio should be lower than one. Actually, what happens is that uh, looking, if you replace the reliability function uh, with the uh, proper exponential, general exponential with constant failure rate, 
in both cases up and down to this in, in this equation you will find that in the best way this uh, ratio is equal to one so uh, performing preventive maintenance on electronic components is barely useless and also uh, you can have damages because every time you assemble or disassemble electronic you can you have a chance to make a mistake instead making preventive maintenance of, on mechanical component has a benefit because it can be proven that this ratio has an advantage if the uh, failure rate uh, is described by a weighable probability density function where beta is greater than one, okay? So in case of the uh, mechanical component, as we have said before in, uh, concerning the bathtub curve, okay? Uh, I'm short in time, so let, let me skip this part and let's go to some kind of example, okay? Uh, we have seen at the beginning that uh, the failure rate follows the bathtub curve. So you have seen that at the very beginning, it starts from the upper part, it goes down, then it should keep constant, and then it should increase. Okay, this is a, a real example taken from uh, an LNG plant. LNG means liquefied natural gas plant. What, what do you see? Here, this, there is the failure rate that is decreasing, yes, and then it's increasing, but then it's decreasing again. So what does it happen? Here, I cannot exploit the theory that I have or that I had before. Uh, so it means that it was wrong? No. The point is that in actual application and in complex realities like the one of the oil and gas plant, there is also the part of commissioning phase that usually is not embedded into the theory. So it means that sometimes the bathtub curve is not enough to describe a very complex uh, situation like this one, okay? So you cannot, cannot have just the weighable probability density function that is enough as it is to describe and to model this kind of system. So you have, as an engineer, to modify something in order to let your weighable function to fit this kind of, of reality. So what happens is that your reliability function now has more parameter. You have more characteristic life depending on the time instant where you are and more um, uh, uh, key factor, shape factors, depending on, on what you are considering. With the constraint that the probability density function is equal to the minus the derivative of the reliability and that the other function is the ratio between the failure, the probability density function and the reliability, you can try to develop an equation that fits your uh, needs and is able to uh, comply the uh, constraints of your data from the field. So in this case, let me show what happens. You had this shape and what happens is that you can find different parameters, beta one, beta two, beta three, eta one, eta two, eta three, in order to fit exactly this kind of model. So what you get is something like this, that is not the best fit, but provides you with a great aid because you have a closed form that helps you in predicting what will be your reliability in any kind of time. And this is, because you were able to uh, find the best fitting of uh, a, mm, a function that is satisfying all the constraints of reliability, okay? At the end of the story, exploiting this kind of uh, um, uh, information that you get uh, from uh, the previous uh, parameters, you get a reliability function that has this behavior. So you are well aware of which will be in the future the behavior of your plant considering the uh, uh, information that you get at the beginning to build your uh, weighable, modified weighable uh, function, okay? These are other cases that in practical lights are happening uh, uh, for different plants. These are three different plants. And uh, uh, you can identify this uh, called change point where you have a change into the slope of the failure rate, okay? So uh, it's not something that is a single uh, case. This happened in real life, that the failure rate is not following the bathtub curve. And this is due to, for example, in this case, to the commissioning phase, because uh, here you have that humans, and in particular, um, the art, play the role in the
determining how the plant should be managed, okay? So reliability science is taking into consideration, as it's described in the books, takes into consideration physical part and mechanical part, electronic part, physical failure modes, but you have to consider that in real life, also the way how you use a plant modifies the, the failure rate or can modify or has an impact on the failure rate, can have a, an impact on the failure rate, okay? Of course, you can use uh, the solution that is proposed or you can even try to model your system with a uh, uh, piecewise linear uh, function. What is the difference? Uh, on one side is more simple, but it's not a generalized solution. So what happens is that you have a model that fits exactly your system as you have depicted, but it's, it's not uh, a general way to approach similar plants, okay? So every time you should reinvent the wheel and, and you should start modeling again your system from scratch. How do we pass from reliability to safety? Um, uh, just to, to tell you here some hints. If you want to study safety of an item, uh, safety means that your system should always be under control. It doesn't mean that the system will never fail, okay? Safe means that even if something happens, your system is always under control, okay? So there is no the case where your system is going to fail and you don't know what's going to happen. Okay? You're always placing your system in a state where you have the control of everything. And uh, uh, the, the basic standard to study safety in all the system is uh, the so-called IEC 615508 standard. It's divided into seven uh, small books. And it's a general purpose uh, standard for electronic, electrical, and programmable electronic equipment. But it's not limited to that. It's also applicable to mechanical system because at the end of the story, your system is always uh, defined in terms of uh, um, a, a sensor chain, a logic solver chain, and the final element chain, okay? So this kind of standard uh, divided in, into several standards depending on the specific application. For example, for oil and gas, you have the 61511. And uh, for railway, you have the EN 50, 126, 28, and 29 standard. For nuclear, you have the GSG 1.1. For the automotive, the 26, 262, and so on, okay? So all these standards are just coming from this basic standard. If you study this standard, then you're able to understand all the others. What is the peculiarity of this standard? Before, we have seen the failure rate, no? For reliability and availability standard. For safety, you have to start thinking that there are some failures that are more severe than others. And you can divide basically them into safe standard, safe failures and dangerous failures. But this is not enough. Then you can think that these safe uh, failure rates can be divided into um, uh, dangerous, uh, sorry, detectable safe uh, failure, failures and undetectable or dangerous detectable or dangerous undetectable. These latter in particular are the ones that are determining the, um, the, 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 the safety of a, a function, okay? So uh, exploiting the safe part and the dangerous detectable part of uh, your item, you can build the so-called SFF, which is uh, the safe failure fraction, which is just the ratio between the uh, sum of the safe failures and the dangerous detectable over the overall failures. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, we can define the safety integrity level, which is the level you have to bring your system to to be compliant with a certain safety standard, depending on four main level, okay? Actually, these are five. SIL zero, it means that you don't need any kind of safety uh, prescription. Uh, SIL1, it means uh, it's you have to bring uh, your system to have a probability of failure on demand between 10 and minus 2 and 10 and minus 1. And uh, if you want to rise your system up to the safety integrity level 4, it means that the probability of failure on demand should uh, be lowered from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus so the highest is the safety integrity level required by your application. The highest is the effort you have to bring in in order to uh, build your uh, electronics or build your hardware in general. 
In particular, this standard tells you that you can divide all your system into two kind or two huge families of components. One is called tape I and the other one is called tape B, okay? Uh, for tape A component, it means that your system is well known, okay? So it's uh, well aware, it's uh, something that you have already tested and so on. And uh, instead for tape B, it's something that you have already uh, um, not completely defined and it's not well known, okay? So it's something that you should start from scratch in terms of understanding of the overall failure mode. It's not exhaustive. And here you have some constraints because you will, looking at the yellow columns, no? If you are in, in terms of uh, um, uh, hardware fault tolerance, that is uh, uh, a, a hardware fault tolerance that is zero, that is once your system is broken, you're losing the safety function. Basically with uh, a type uh, B uh, component, once with the other uh, kind of component, you can get uh, SIL level three, with the other one, you can get SIL two and so on. So it means with the new brand new components, you have uh, uh, higher constraints that with well-known component. And, and that's obvious. For example, you have to consider that on the shuttle, there was the uh, 8086 uh, processor. And the reason was not because the other more advanced processor were not available, but it was just because they were really exploited and really well known in terms of failure modes. And you cannot have something that is unexpected once you are far away from the Earth and you are in orbit, okay? Uh, there is another parameter that is well used that's called diagnostic coverage. Uh, basically, uh, the diagnostic cover defines which is the, um, uh, the, the effective of the diagnostic. And this helps because uh, in the standards, you have some tables that help you and drives you in bringing the right level of the safety depending on the diagnostic coverage of your system. This is the basic structure of a standard uh, safety chain. You start from sensor, you go to a logic solver, and you go to a final element. In a, for example, oil and gas application, the sensor is a pressure transducer. Then you go to a logic solver, which can be a Microsoft processor or a programmable logic array, whatever you want. And you actuate a, a valve, for example. So that's the reason why I told you at the very beginning that this standard is not only applicable to electrical and electronic and programmable electronic components. You have also an actuator and an actuator usually is a mechanical component, which can be a relay, it can be a valve, it can be um, a shutdown system, but it's something that has to interact physically with your system. So the standard is more generally applicable to, um, to mechanical components, okay? So uh, here, um, uh, this is just to give you an overview of uh, uh, what's going on on safety. Of course, if you want to get deeper uh, involvement in this kind of subject, you have to consider that here, instead of a single block, the sensor can be also redundancies of sensors. Logic solver can be a redundance of logic solvers. Usually they are placed in voting conditions. And the final element usually is not a final element. It can be a series of elements as is depicted here in this uh, a function. And this is exa an example of what you can get in oil and gas. If you want to get an SIL level of one, usually you have a single chain. If you want to get an SIL two, you should have at least two chains performing independently the same kind of function or covering the same kind of function. And in an SIL three, you should have a, a, at least a, a, a voting system where you have a two out of three, for example, in this case condition where you have three sensors and the logic solver is taking a decision on uh, at least the two input of the same kind com coming from the... Uh, how do we get that uh, mathematically? Uh, for example, we can exploit what we said for market modeling because we can build the same kind of model we have built for uh, studying availability, but instead of having failure rate and repair rate, we will have different kind of failure rates once we have been able to divide them in their uh, detectable, undetectable, safe, and dangerous part, okay? So here, the big effort for safety is understanding once I get the failure rate from a system, which is the safe part and which is the dangerous part which is the detectable part and which is the undetectable part, okay? 
So uh, that's it. I am, I'm concluding this kind of uh, overview uh, on a system, uh, reliability, availability, and safety. And so I'm, I'm pretty open if, if you have questions, OK? Hello? Sri, is there anyone? Yes. Yes. Was, who has been a constant support and uh, has always been a constant so source of motivation and support. Thank you, ma'am. I thank Shiomas uh, IEEE Instrumentation and Measurement Society Student Chapter Advisor who supported us from the beginning and helped us in every step. Thank you, sir. I thank the whole crew who worked behind for the successful culmination, culmination of this program. I know they have worked day and night for making this event a success, successful one. Thank you, guys. Last but not the least, I thank all the audience who was with us from the beginning. You guys have been always been our motion for coming up with something or the other. Thank you, guys. I hope you will be joining us with for the future events also. Thank you all. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, guys. And that's the end of the session. Thank you all for the for participating in the session. Stay happy healthy and have a good night bye uh before leaving the meet uh before quitting the meet i would request everyone who have attended the session to kindly fill the feedback form so that we can improve a lot for the upcoming webinars thank you and have a great time <laughs>